Hey folks, Dr. Mike Israel here for Renaissance Periodization. Nucleus overload training, you've been asking about it and I'm answering. We're gonna take a critical look, upsides, downsides, so on and so forth. Now, before we start, different folks have different ideas slightly of what this means. We're sort of shooting for the average. So I'm really sorry if I mischaracterize it. I promise it wasn't on purpose. I did some interneting to try to find out what it is that it really was. I found out some stuff. Hopefully I'm not too far off the mark. So today we're gonna to talk about what nucleus overload training is. What are the potential benefits to it? What are some unanswered questions about it? And what are the potential up, uh, upsides, or sorry, potential downsides, so those benefits, unanswered questions, downsides, and then lastly, should you try it? Because you're probably thinking, should I try it? Let's get started. So first of all, what is nucleus overload training? It's essentially, and there's a lot of ways to skin the cat. The cat hates all those ways, by the way, it's miserable. Um, it's training with a lot of volume and intensity what you can term an unsustainable amount of volume and intensity in the long term, okay? And this is usually done for a period of several weeks to a month and potentially more. We'll be charitable and say two to four weeks. But some of the programs call for six weeks plus. That's a whole level of insanity that's a bit different, but it's really just a ton of psychotic training, which may be a good thing, maybe a bad, right? The idea here, the hypothesis is based on myonuclear domain sealing, which is pretty well vetted and here's what it is. The amount of muscle, uh, or sorry, the amount of muscle volume a single cell nucleus in a muscle cell can control is limited. The easiest and actually almost homologous analogy here is one city government can only control a city that's so big, right? If you have like one city government, one municipal building, one courthouse, one place where the ambulances park, one fire department, how much area can it actually help? Like if there's a fire half a mile away, one fire department, little, you know, little town with a fire department can handle it no problem. If that town grows in size without adding any more control centers like municipal building, fire department, so on and so forth, water treatment plant, if that stuff grows out to matrix style pre-robot battle city of a hundred miles, you know, look, one fire department and you got a fire 90 miles away, let that motherfucker burn because we're not getting there on time to do shit, right? At some point, a city can get so big that it needs multiple control centers, multiple regions to do stuff. Think about New York City. Yeah, Manhattan has its own shit. Brooklyn's technically a part of New York, but it, Brooklyn has its own fire department with its own multiple stations and so on and so forth. Things have to sort of fractal out because central control centers only have so much reach. Just the same way, literally almost exactly the same way, a cell nucleus, which is the control center of the cell to some extent, can control and sort of manage and keep well functioning only a certain volume, spherical volume around it. When a muscle grows bigger than that, it decays in function quite rapidly. Great thing, evolution thought of that shit already. So at some point when your muscle cells get to a certain size, growth stops. It doesn't really stop, but growth no longer happens by just the addition of a cell volume outside of one nucleus. What happens is, there's satellite cells all around a typical muscle cell, and usually they're like the full-size nucleus, but not a lot of stuff around it. And it's kind of dormant. It doesn't do a whole lot. When this myonuclear domain, this total volume that one nucleus can control, gets big enough, some signaling occurs, and it's like, hey, pfft, wake up. We need help. So essentially, another fire department opens up 20 miles away, and voila, you get the same level of coverage. This nucleus essentially floats into this cell. And now instead of having one nucleus here with a bunch of stuff around it that it can control, this new nucleus, myonuclear addition occurs, satellite cell maturation occurs. Now you have two nuclei and they can control, well, double the area or something or a lot more area. So muscle cells grow essentially in two ways and muscles grow in two ways. They go grow through expansion of just regular myonuclear domain. When the myonuclear domain hits its ceiling of like what well, this is just too much to control, the satellite cells proliferate in and help the whole thing to get bigger by addition of myonuclei, okay? Once added, the myonuclei, because like if you started with the total volume you can't grow beyond, with one nucleus, when you have two nuclei, you can grow more volume now. So now your body will grow more muscle as long as nuclei keep being added. 
nucleus overload training hypothetically, allegedly, boosts growth by taking the satellite cell incorporation process and making it go faster. So maybe you grow a certain amount and then the myonuclear domain comes and the growth really slows. And then nucleus is like, hey, hurry up and help me out. And the other nuclei are like, oh, what's going on? Uh, I guess we'll get in there our own do fucking time, brush their teeth and floss and put on three outfits, take one off, so on and so forth. Man, uh, the uh, nucleus overload training claims or hypothesizes that it can get those myonuclei to help out faster. That as soon as the growth starts to slow per one unit nuclear volume, then the satellite, if you do this kind of training, the idea is boom, the satellite cells incorporate more rapidly and then voila, you get this part and then boom, boom, boom. And all of a sudden you're getting much more jacked much more quickly, allegedly, okay? So what are the potential benefits of it? Assuming we sort of know what we know with sports science so far. So assuming there's no crazy magic that happens, what are the potential benefits of it cutting it no extra slack whatsoever. Well, first of all, it's functional overreaching. Pretty well documented process. When you go beyond the muscle's normal ability to recover in a brief time, you can get really, really impressive gains if you pull back right after. It is a super compensation model of hypertrophy. You really push the pace, then really pull back and you get a large measure of muscle hypertrophy confirmed in the laboratory with multiple studies the thing is, this process in a real world probably only works well if you exceed your maximum recoverable volume, which is the whole point of this, um, for like one or two weeks. And two weeks, geez, that's a lot. If you folks watching have ever been in excess of your MRV, truly training hard, um, two weeks in excess of MRV is like hell, okay? You don't even know what's up and what's down anymore. And it's dangerous because you can get into what is called non-functional overreaching when you bounce back, but the bounce back just corrects the muscle you lost bouncing up. You don't want to be in that part. So three weeks, that's psychotic. That's probably going to be non-functional, right? One week of overreaching may be a good idea. So potentially by doing nucleus overload training or something like it for one or two weeks, you can get this big rebound effect and gain muscle on the net balance. So nucleus overload training, which from now on I'm going to call NOT, right? Uh, NOT is very likely to lead to overreaching because it's just a ton of training all at the same time. So it might help boost muscle growth in this context, especially if you're in a situation where you thought your MRV was this, but it's really that. If you've been underdoing your volume for a while, for a variety of reasons. Maybe you started out with low volume, maybe you trained with a training partner that just had a lower MRV than you, and it turns out your MRV is actually here, nucleus overload training either goes here or even here, and all of a sudden you're doing a ton more volume, you're like, oh my God, nucleus overload training is getting me fucking jacked, this is unbelievable. It's magic, it's the nuclei, the satellite cells, I'm a fucking science project, this is sweet. Well, maybe what's going on is you've just been underdoing it a ton. And the people that tend to benefit the most, if you read the forums, <laughs> which I do all the time, I have no friends. If you look, a lot of the people that are benefiting from nucleus overload training are ones that weren't really pushing the pace with volume to begin with. And they're actually underdoing it by a long shot. So here, big potential benefits, right? Now, what are the unanswered questions here? Because I said earlier, if we don't assume any magic, well, here's the magic. The mechanisms of nuclear addition are just not well established. We don't have a good replicated reliable time course for when do we reach a myonuclear domain? How long after reaching myonuclear domain ceiling, or sorry, the ceiling, how long after reaching the ceiling does it take for satellite cells to be incorporated? Um, how hard do you have to train? If you just train normally, do the satellite cells normally incorporate every time a myonuclear domain ceiling is hit? Or <clears throat> is satellite cell incorporation especially profound when you go really above your ability to recover? Is it like an emergency valve that only really turns on when you go psychotic? Or is it one of those situations where if you just train normally, which means occasionally really hard, it happens anyway? We just don't know, right? So, if you're going super hard for weeks and weeks and weeks, you're kind of risking, you know, we'll talk about what risks you're taking in a little bit, um, to bet on an unknown, right? Because if you tell someone in the gym, someone's like, dude, this is your third week of like doing insane volume. You're like, yeah, like, what's the upside here? Like, what's this for? Like, well, you see, 
satellite cells and fucking myonuclei. And someone will, what's that? You're like, I don't really know. Like, you got any studies about that? Like, no, they actually don't have any studies about that. I'm like, okay. So why are you doing this again? You're like, I, I, I'm not really sure. Okay. Maybe it's worth a try, but oof, it's not confirmed enough. So some people are selling these methods and, hey, listen, more power to them. Be a little skeptical about like, hey, is there a ton of science backing it? I'll save you experience. The answer is no. And th that might they might still be correct because science can catch up. But it's not this obvious thing like, oh, yeah, we know for sure that if you train like a psycho for four weeks and then take a deload, you grow tons of muscle because this exact myonuclear pathway occurs. Bullshit. We just don't know that at all. Right. And here's the real kicker. You get a lot of growth out of training hard. And you're like, fucking nuclei. It's the nuclei, right? You have no idea if when you get impressive growth results, if it's mostly from the expansion of just the normal, you have a normal nucleus and you're way off your myonuclear domain. And if it's just the normal expansion or if it's capped the normal expansion, it's the addition of satellite cells that gives you that extra growth. There's no way to tell with our current technology unless they piece you apart and, well, they don't put you back together after that. Unless you're getting muscle biopsies, you have no idea what the mechanism of that growth is. So when they say, well, it's nuclear overload training, here's this crazy program. The crazy program can work, but then you're not actually sure that it's the more rapid incorporation of new, uh, new nuclei that's actually doing the work. You have no idea. And then it's like, yeah, maybe this program is good because it's high volume and you know high frequency or whatever, and that's good for its own sake, but it might just be like through conventional pathways that you still get better, right? Maybe. And here's the thing. If you're a beginner, you have probably filled so little of your myonuclear domain, most of the beginner gains you get, remember noob gains, right? these are the most impressive gains you'll ever get. Most of those are within domain, right? You're not adding a ton of satellite cells in many cases as a beginner or as many as you would be potentially later because you don't need them. Your muscle cells are small and they have plenty of room to grow. As an intermediate advanced, it's almost always gonna be a combination of the two because as soon as you add in a satellite cell nucleus, it's got its own domain that is now expandable, but it's absolutely possible that while this satellite cell's domain, new domain expands to its limits, another satellite cell is incorporated here on this side and it starts its expansion and this expansion has already stopped. It's all happening at the same time. And this is why when you grow muscle, your muscles kind of just steadily grow and grow and grow. It's not like nothing happens, nothing happens, nothing happens. Satellite cells come in and then three weeks later, you're like, Baka! like that's not how growth works. It's a more smooth and gradual process because probably most things are happening at the same time, which is to say, and I don't want to be talking mad shit here, though I'm getting started, nuclear overload training, nucleus, nucleus overload training, NOT, its big claim is like, this is how the growth is happening. It's through this nuclear pathway of addition. It's charitably, we don't know, not charitably, it's definitely a combination of that and regular growth. But that doesn't sell, it doesn't sound as sexy, so it doesn't make the headlines, right? Now, what are the potential downsides? This potential benefit is like functional overreaching, you get some fucking mad gains. There's definitely some unknowns. Potential downsides, here we go. Non-functional overreaching, which is when you do all this crazy psychotic work and then you get worse and then on the rebound, you just get back to where you were, is very possible. It is especially possible with two or more weeks of going beyond MRV, beyond your maximum recoverable volume. If training feels like it's unsustainable and you're getting weaker, that's a bad thing. If you get weaker for two or three weeks straight, you're probably just losing muscle. That's really bad and there's no upside to that, right? Again, that's not the only problem. So that's a big problem by itself. Problem number two is rushing into super high volumes risks injury quite a bit. Nothing crazy, but it's certainly you're rolling the dice for, again, something that may not be clearly beneficial and you're rolling them pretty hard. So here's what I mean. If you're normally used to doing, let's say 10 sets per muscle group per session, or let's say 10 sets per week, this is your normal volume. Your systems and tissues are used to that sort of thing, connective tissues especially. If you find a... Uh, nucleus overload training program online, and then the next day or the next week you go to 30, right around here, you may be getting hurt because your connective tissues are like, holy fucking shit, they're getting hit in the face all left and right and center. It's just too much to recover from. If you want to ramp your volume, the best way to do it is to start from 10 and then try 11, see how it feels, and then try 12 and see how it feels, and then 13, see how it feels, and then deload. 
and then try 11 again, and then 12, and then 13, and then 14, and then deal it, just like that. And then slowly over many, many months and years, you find where your best volumes are, your best volume ranges for growth. That if you're used to 10 and you go to 30, that's just bad news. Again, you might slide by, you probably will, with no injury. And you'll be like, hey, it fucking worked. Or you slide by with no injury, but you're still in a number one, so you lose muscle. <laughs> And then it sucks, right? That may very well happen, but it's a big risk to take. It's a notable risk, and I want you guys to be aware of that. Lastly, getting to a high volume is already injurious, or probabilistically more injurious. Staying at a really high volume is an additive independent factor for injury. So like, if you're two weeks into this nuclear overload training, and you're like, hey, I didn't get hurt. <laughs> Continuing for three or four weeks is like, continuing to be in a super high degree of danger, right? It's like one of those, uh, <clears throat> it's one of my favorite um, little like things from the movies that are fucking insane is when like a guy's like in a submarine or in a submersible suit and he's like going down to fix the oil rig and like he's going way too low, but he has to to save whatever fucking oil workers. And he like gets down to like 50 meters below, like whatever depth it says on the side of your helmet not to go below. And the suit's like, <laughs> and he's like, oh shit, they're fucking, the needles past the red. And, th and then he's still at the same depth, like 50 meters below where he's supposed to be. And then he's like, all right, all right, nothing's happening, we're good. Right, And then he just works there for two hours. What the fuck? Every minute you spend is another minute for the shit to just go bam, <laughs> right? Like if you're in a building, God forbid, and it partially collapses, and you're like, oh my God, fuck, fuck. And there's people are falling out of windows and shit collapsing. And then you catch like on some kind of like, you know, still like partially erect wall. And you're like, oh, okay, okay, we're good. Everyone go back to work. Like, no, that's fucking crazy. <laughs> you don't go back to work. You calmly try to get the fuck out as soon as possible. So in this scenario, when you go to 30 sets or whatever crazy shit you're doing with nuclear overload training, if you don't get hurt in the first one or two weeks, okay, you dodge that bullet. But then there's a guy with a machine gun of volume shooting your ass for the entire time that you're up there. And you're just rolling the dice casino style to try to get hurt. Not a good idea. Certainly an idea that requires stepping back and wondering if it's worth it. And to that end, lastly, number five, should you try it? Should you try nuclear overload training? Well, nuclear addition probably happens in normal training. We have no good reason to believe that normal training doesn't add um, uh, nuclei, okay? And, and we have a bonus point. Training as we at RP recommend, starting at relatively low volumes and slowly and smoothly, coming up to very high and sustainable ones, touching them briefly and then coming down, that super high exposure at a week or so at MRV, probably if there is something to that really hard training stimulates nuclear overload, that covers that base anyway. Yeah, I understand if you always do 12 sets and you never do 14 or 16, you may be missing out on some shit. But if you start with around 10, you go to 16 or 18, man, yeah, 16 or 18 is probably gonna fry you up enough to do whatever it is nuclear overload training claims to do anyway. And in normal training, because you're only up at MRV for like a week or so, you don't risk non-functional overreaching, right? That's a big deal. It's awesome to go hard and to go for as long as you can survive, but beyond that point, it's fucking stupid. It gets you hurt, and worst of all, it costs you muscle. Can you imagine having the hardest week of training of your life, week three of overreaching, and then in retrospect, you're like, yep, I lost muscle that week. I mean, it's one thing to train easy and not gain muscle. You know, nothing wagered, nothing lost. Uh, or minimum wagered, nothing gained. Uh, if you train as hard as fucking humanly possible, all that blood, sweat, and tears, to lose muscle, what the fuck are you doing in the gym? That's literally backwards, right? If you do psychotic programs, which cram your volume like crazy and then extend it out for forever or for a long time, weeks and weeks and weeks, you're just risking... Mm, for like a pretty significant risk of muscle loss, injury, so on and so forth. So that's not to say you can't try it. I'm not contradicting myself, if I can promise. Here's the deal, you can try nuclear overload training. You can even try it. If you see a program online, you're like, ooh, I'm gonna try that. You can, but here are a couple of recommendations of how to do it responsibly for your best interests at heart. Here's the deal, ramp up to it. If someone says, hey, listen, here's the program, 30 sets is what you wanna be, if you're at 10, Dude, try 12, try 14, okay? A week later, two weeks later, try 16. Two weeks later, try 18. And at 18, you might be like the guy in the fucking dive suit where you're like crinkling in on yourself and you're like, fuck that, 30, I can't even see that deep, fuck that, right? And, and then you pull back 
to eight or to six, rec relax, recover, grow. And you're like, oh my God, that really works. And you realize your overreaching only needed to go to 18 sets and 30 was just some wild dream that was gonna be a disaster. Or you keep ramping, keep ramping, keep ramping and you get incredible results. Of course, deal it every now and again. But like you get up to 30 eventually months later and you have the best gains of your life. Hey, success. And another option is you get up to 18 or 20 and you just get really tired, really fucked up. Nothing happens. You pull back and dilute or you just get back the gains you lost. You're like, well, look, if 18 to 20 was too much, what the fuck would I be doing 30 for? That's nuts, right? So at least ramp up into it because there's no rush. And the ramping, in addition to finding out if it's even a good idea, takes that risk of that excessive first boost and reduces it substantially, which is a really good thing. Next risk is the one where you stay too high for too long. So here's this one. Don't go longer than two weeks with ultra high volumes way beyond your maximum recoverable volume. If you're super fucking fucking beat up, just out of this world, like barely eyes open, coming into the gym to do something, don't do that. Don't push past the limits for two weeks. That's dumb it's gonna result in bad things unless you're one of the super lucky ones and you can survive it and be okay. That's not how pro bodybuilders make gains. That's not how anyone makes gains unless you're super, super lucky. It's just a formula for high risk of injury and just a shitty fucking time and probably no muscle gain to show for it or a minimal one or an amount you could have done with much less training, okay? If you have ego problems, go join an MMA gym and get punched in the face. When you come to the gym to do hypertrophy training, do your best. Because remember, you're there to grow muscle, not to challenge yourself arbitrarily. You want to challenge yourself? Take up marathon running. It's just way harder than anything you can do in the weight room. Afterwards, deload big. Okay, don't do, if you survive a block of, of this crazy training, don't just go back to normal training. Deload, take at least a week of really easy training. That's when a lot of these things are going to express themselves. That's maybe when you get a lot more muscle growth and the realization of this muscle growth occurs and you drop all the fatigue you've accumulated so that the next program you start fresh can actually be fresh. Instead of taking all that fatigue during the buildup and carrying it over into your next program, poisoning that next program as well, right? After that deload, assess your results so that you know either damn, I'm onto some good shit. I'm going to repeat this every now and again. Or, damn, this is good shit, but it was really fatiguing, so I'm going to repeat it very rarely, only when I'm in the, at the top of a mass gain phase, eating a ton of food, resting a ton. Or you're like, that was fucking stupid. I didn't get shit out of it except a bum knee. I'm not probably going to do that again for either a long time or ever. Or, you know, you get halfway through and you have to deal it because you got hurt or you got burned out, and then you're like, well, fuck that. So be intelligent, be smart. Those are the same thing. Ease in, don't rush. That one program that's gonna solve all your problems and get you those crazy gains you never thought was possible does not fucking exist. I don't sell it, we don't sell it on RP. Nobody else has it either. Good programming is about finding out the basic general principles of training harder than last time. There you go, a little Greg Desat impression for you. It's too easy. It's Iago from Aladdin. You guys all know that already. Training harder than last time, making sure that the uh, eventually you hit failure and eventually you're really challenging yourself, deloading and repeating, picking the exercises to stimulate your muscles with minimum fatigue to your joints, so on and so forth, and playing around with whatever volumes, starting from the low end, going up a little higher, whatever volumes get you your best growth. That's training. And all that requires knowing the principles and then customizing them, them to yourself. Nobody has a prepackaged program to sell you that's gonna solve all of your problems for you at once or get you this miracle growth you've never gotten. We've got programs in RP, I fucking designed them shits, and the only thing I can say for them is they do that process I just described calmly, slowly, carefully, and they work pretty well, right? I'm fucking trying to sell you guys programs and all I can say is they work pretty well, there's no miracles. What do you think I'm gonna say about programs I haven't made? Folks, be patient, do your best, don't fall for bullshit, and if you're gonna try some crazy shit, ease into it. See you next time.